Next is Dr. Carla Jenkins, and she's going to talk to us about uh, uh, how we can deal with some of these issues that we're just talking about, this limited forage situation that we have. Well, let's take advantage of some of this residue, and uh, she'll talk about uh, using byproducts and, and limit the cattle. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you. Okay, so that is what I was asked to talk about, and so that will be my talk. Um, but I want to make sure that I give a little credit to the other people that have helped us with this research. In addition to myself, um, Dr. Rick Rasby, Terry Klopfenstein um, are also involved in this cow-calf um, confinement research. Dr. Matt Luby and Galen Erickson have let us use their feedlots for cows and calving cows in feedlots, and, and so you know credit needs to be uh, acknowledged there for sure. Jason Warner is a graduate student on this project, and we have great technicians that have helped take care of these cows. And then we've also gotten funding from the Ken and Carolyn Ng Foundation for this as well. So we wanted to note that and, and appreciate everybody's involvement in this project. So as Kate was just saying, just because we get rain, that doesn't necessarily mean that immediately um, we have grass again. And I just wanted to make that point visually here, showing you that as we continue to graze off grass, it does not have that opportunity to regrow root depth. And so when it's stressed and there's no moisture and we keep letting those cows go back and take off that little green grass, then that becomes reflective of root depth under the soil. So that's what you're seeing on some of those hills. Yeah, it shows they've got rain, but there's no grass there. Well, sometimes there's not, because if that soil profile doesn't have moisture in it until we get way down the bottom, the plant on the right is going to be able to reach that moisture. Uh, but certainly the little plant on the left is going to die, because it's not going to get that. So we can destock to some extent, but sometimes when we're in a severe situation, we need to get those cows out of there because they're going to chase that, that little green grass. And so this project um, looks at some of that. So there's that. There's drought. And obviously, in the Nebraska area, uh, we have chronic drought. This is not going to be a one-time deal. Uh, contrary to what we hope, we're not, we'd like to think we're only going to have one time that we're going to have drought, but it's going to come back around. And Kate mentioned that we've got more crop production acres, and so that takes away from our grass. We have urbanization that takes away from grass. So what that does is it puts an increased value on grass. So there's times that we just flat don't have grass, and we may have to consider uh, putting cows in confinement. But we also maybe need to do a little bit of a paradigm shift where we always think grass is our cheapest place to put our cows. Maybe that's changing. and that's high-quality grass that will put gain on calves, maybe that's where we need to put them and feed residues, byproducts, cheaper sources of feed to the cow. So it's just kind of a, um, a shift. Um, then that will, um, that shift in thinking um, as we go forward and you look at some of these slides, just want you to keep that in mind. So we're going to talk about confinement feeding cows and a project that we've been doing. So when we limit feed cows in confinement, we do this because we can have energy-dense byproducts that we can mix with low-quality residues, and we can make a pretty nice diet. And if it's high enough in energy, then we can limit the dry matter, the actual intake of the cow, but maintain her condition. So some of the research that we've looked at is how can we limit how much we actually feed them, not let them have everything they want. Um, but use these energy-dense feeds to bring up the quality of the diet and maintain that cow while still um, not feeding her everything she wants. So I'm going to show you an example of a couple of diets that I have used in the panhandle. And um, these do include beet pulp. Not everybody here has access to beet pulp, but you probably have access to some other um, byproducts, whether that be distillers or um, corn gluten feed, um, bran, different things that might be available that can be mixed with residues and make this a little higher quality. So the first diet is 60% uh, wheat straw on a dry matter basis with 20% wet distillers. These are all dry matter. Um, and then 20% beet pulp. That makes a mixture that's about 50% dry matter. So then you would feed twice that on an as-is basis. But we were able to maintain cows on about 18 pounds of dry matter on this diet. And these were um, gestating cows, so late gestation, not lactating yet. We also compared this diet to the one 
on the right as well as and um, straw, so 30% distillers, 70% um, straw. Cows maintained weight. Um, in this other diet on the right, we've got the wheat straw down to 35% of the diet dry matter, beet pulp uh, up to 45. So with that shift in energy, we actually dropped those cows down to 15 pounds of dry matter. And they maintained weight just the same as the other cows. And we've done this with some other diets that would just include um, distillers and straw or distillers and corn stalks, um, whatever is available you can do. So this would show you those two diets, um, the 20% uh, beet pulp diet with the 20% distillers or the 45 beet pulp with, again, 20% distillers. Those cows started out in the same um, weight, same body condition. They ended up a little heavier. Part of that's due to the fact that the fetus and the membranes are, are growing and adding weight added a little bit of body condition score to those cows during that 70-ish day trial. Um, so we added a little bit of um, body condition, did a little better than maintain those, but we still got these cows between a 5 and a 6 condition score. So very moderate, but certainly um, acceptable condition. Um, and as I noted, we also compared that first diet to some 30% distillers, uh, 70 straw and got that same result, that we didn't lose condition on those cows at all. Um, but as the drought has moved forward and as we shift our thinking of who needs what forages, there comes that point in time that that cow is going to have a calf and you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do. And this year, at least in western Nebraska, um, we've had to keep cows off pasture because as was just noted, there's just some green in some of the pastures, but there's not enough grass to turn out. And so we've had a lot of people saying, OK, I've calved, but I still have nowhere to go with these cows. And so we've also done some of this work with um, the lactating cow in confinement, as well as the, just the pregnant cow. But there's things that you need to remember. When you've been feeding those cows all winter, they haven't had that baby yet, they have one requirement. When they start lactation, they have another one, and so you have to make changes. And I've had producers kind of run into a little bit of a hiccup there because they didn't make those adjustments. And so I just wanted with this slide to point out the difference between the blue line being the cow that has an energy requirement for lactation and the red line being an early weaned cow that you take that calf away from. You're going to have to account for that energy need uh, for that cow, and uh, or you're going to have to remove the calf. If you have high quality forage pivots that you can put early weaned calves on, but you don't have enough to run pairs on it, well then maybe you do that. Maybe you can take that calf somewhere else and go ahead and early wean. But one way or the other, you have to account for that, um, that energy for that cow. So when you have to go account, if you want to leave the calf with the cow, you can change that energy requirement one of two ways. You can increase the amount of dry matter that you're actually feeding her or you can increase the amount of energy in the diet that you're giving her. So here would be an example of that. If you had a 30-70 on a dry matter basis, distillers and residue diet, um, they tell me how to use this little pointer here, so we're going to try this. Oh, there it went. OK. So the difference here, this would be for a lactation diet versus this is the amount of pounds of dry matter for just late gestation. If you compare that to this diet with the 40% distillers, this is almost the same amount of dry matter, um, but it provides more energy to meet her needs. If you don't change that diet, then you have to up the amount of feed. So there's some different options as producers that you have. I have this down here where we actually fed this diet with 60% distillers and 40% straw. And I have this adjust out here because the other thing you have to account for is what the calf starts to eat. How long are we going to be feeding this lactating cow? Are we talking you know, just until we get everything calved out and then we feel like we have grass and we move on? Are they going to be there a while? Well, that calf is going to start to eat. So you have to start accounting for not only her increased needs, but the needs of the calf if the pair is going to be in confinement very long. Um, so as I said, we had a diet. We had this trial where we fed these cows in total confinement. Um, they, were not, um, they were not 
they've never been out since we started this study. They stay in the feedlot all the time. So the calves were between 80 and 90 days, um, on average closer to 90, I spoke. When we started the 60% wet distillers, 40% straw or stocks diet, then we, at that point, because these calves were uh, about 90 days old, we weaned half of them. So we had an early weaned group, and then we allowed the other cows to keep their calves with them until um, the 205, typical 205 weaning weight. And so we fed 15 pounds of dry matter to the weaned cows, and then we fed 22 pounds of dry matter to the, to the pairs. Um, this is the data showing that before breeding, which that would be the other thing, is that once we pulled half of those calves, then we turned bulls in with both those groups for a 60-day breeding season. And so pre-breeding, right there as we're weaning those early calves off, or doing the early weaning treatment, pulling them off, those um, cows were very similar um, in body weight. We also had two locations for the study. So ARDC is the group of cows that's at me, and then there's another replication of cows at the Panhandle Research Facility in Scotts Bluff. So we had two groups of cows. Um, and so then when we looked at the two groups, EW would be early weaned, NW would be normal weaned, and then you look down here at normal weaning time, uh, this would be how each group uh, is doing. So we have the early weaned and the non-weaned, but then normal weaning time. So this would be in January. We weighed those again to see how the treatments affected them. We had a slightly um, higher weight on the um, early weaned cows there. The body change um, was a little bit heavier for the early weaned cows. Uh, body condition was not different pre-breeding um, or at normal weaning time for either group. And we, uh, so and as weaning did not really change their body condition scoring. So, so little differences in location, but basically we went through this limit feeding these cows, um, pretty, pretty restrictive diet as far as dry matter restriction goes, tried to meet their energy requirements, um, and we still maintained a five to five and a half condition score on the cows. Okay, so it did. It worked pretty well. Um, the calves started out no different at the early weaning point, and did not have statistically uh, different. Uh, this t value would not be statistically different between the the early weaning or the normal weaning um, weights, uh, but did have a little bit more uh, weight gain on the non-weaned or late-weaned calves um, when it was all said and done. So this shows the dry matter intake that was consumed by each group. And we tried to keep these, um, by design, we tried to keep these um, similar. So what we did was we figured out the, um, the need for these early weaned cows to be 15 pounds of dry matter a day on that 60-40 diet. And then their calves were not with them. They were early weaned. But we tried to feed them ad lib. So then whatever they ate, then we added that. That's what the combination of that we fed to the pairs. They're all on the same diet to try to make some energy comparisons. So we got the same amount of, of dry matter in them. And as you see from the performance that we just looked at, those uh, condition scores were similar between the two groups. So that was a little interesting. Um, impact of early weaning on pregnancy rate. Now, we only had one year of data, so um, maybe it's a little early to tell on that if there were differences or not. But at this point, we did not have a difference between pregnancy rate due to early weaning or leaving the cows and calves together. So then the next part I'm going to do with the time that I have left is just to um, to share with you a little bit some of our practical management experiences that we had at our feedlots um, doing this in confinement. So um, this picture, hopefully you can see it. I guess I, it's a little bit dark. But that's basically cows and their calves um, standing in line together at the feed bunk. So um, this is a baby calf. This is a baby calf. This is a mama cow, mama cow. Um, here's a calf. Here's a cow. So, the neat thing about it was that the calves learned to eat 
with their mothers out of the buck. And they learned what a feed truck was. And that made weaning go pretty smooth. So that was kind of one of the concerns is how well they would wean. But they did learn some things on that. Um, Water, calves learn to drink from trough within a few weeks of age. It's important to note that these cows were calved in confinement, but they were also summer calving cows. So maybe confining cows in a feedlot for calving during March in eastern Nebraska would not work as well as, as this did um, in a June-July calving. This year in western Nebraska, we had some March calving cows that what producers did is they just calved them at home on their um, calving grounds like they normally do. And then as soon as they had pretty much everything calved and didn't have anywhere any grass to go with them, then they brought the pears into uh, confinement and fed there because they didn't want to um, try to be calving that time of year in a feedlot. And that worked for them fairly well. But sometimes people think calves get plenty of water from the milk, and that's not true, and that's especially not true in the summer. So need to be sure they can reach the water that Flow is not restricted so that all the cows drink and then the tank takes too long to fill up and they can't reach that or the, or the tank's blown out and they can't get up there. They need to be able to reach the feed bunk. Um, they will start eating at a fairly early age. Um, you need two feet per head for adult cattle for bunk space and one to one and a half for the calves. Um, and this was the pen space that we had available was the 350 to 400 square foot per head. Um, so. Allow plenty of bunk space when you're limit feeding because some cows are going to push other cows around and, and all the feed's going to be consumed fairly quickly. So um, timid cows don't get much chance to come up later, so you really need to make sure that there's plenty of room for everybody to get up there. We added limestone for calcium because byproducts are high in phosphorus and we wanted our calcium phosphorus ratio to be correct. We added rumensin, which can be done up to 200 milligrams per um, head per day, and that's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, for increasing utilization of the forages that they're on. And you should always monitor sulfur and fat levels and byproducts just to make sure you know where you are. We did a grind sizes anywhere from three to seven inches seem to work. We've also, I think at Goodmanson, had wheat straw and distillers mixed in a vertical mixer, so you don't have to necessarily have a grinder and a feed truck and things, but you kind of got to be a little more creative when you don't. Um, but it can be done. You don't have to have uh, concrete bunks. These are, this is actually a picture I got from Rick Rasby where they actually just put a bunk in a fence line. I've had a lot of producers this year um, feeding under a hot wire so that they didn't tromp in it, but they were able to, to reach it and eat it. So that worked um, fairly well for those producers to just go feed out there. But when you do that, if you're out there on a pasture, they're going to continue to consume forage. So you have to be careful because um, you're going to overgraze if they're allowed to be out there. So you have to use, uh, if possible, a winter feed ground, um, a small sacrifice pasture that you know you're, you're going to lose, crop ground if you have a pivot corner, you have some dry land cropping spots that you're kind of following right now anyway. Those are better places than your pastures to uh, run a hot fence and, and feed under it or something. Commercial feedlots have empty pens, sometimes they're willing to feed cows. Um, I've had a banker give me some phone numbers of some guys that are willing to do it. Um, they'll have a yardage charge and they'll have a feed charge, so it's not cheap. Um, they don't do it for free. Uh, but some of them will charge uh, less yardage but more markup on feed um, because of wastage and things like that, shrink. They may charge you differently based on the labor that you need. Are you going to need those cows AI'd while they're in confinement or just feeding them? So that's just something you have to work out with someone that might be willing to do it. Um, the other thing I've come across is they're not always, feedlots are not usually um, have their mindset set on limit feeding animals. They're usually uh, more of a set to ad lib feed. And so I've always volunteered to talk to the owners if you are trying to explain this diet and this limitation to them, and they're like, no, I don't know about that. Well, I've, I've said that I will visit with them and, and show them the diets or talk to their nutritionist if that helps. So in summary, um, energy density is the key to limit feeding. You can, you can limit feed a low-quality hay, but that's not going to maintain cow if, if that doesn't meet her needs. Okay? You've got to have the energy that she requires into her body. 
lactation is going to be an increase on energy demands that um, you need to account for. The other thing that we ask those cows to do right after we ask them to start lactating or about the time they hit peak lactation is breeding. So we really have to be very cognizant of, of where those cows are and what we're asking them to do. Early weaning is a great option um, to help you reduce what you need to do with the cow if you've got something else you can do with the, if you've got somewhere you can go with the calf that seems to be a better option for that. Um, and confined calves have to be able to reach uh, water and feed, and that kind of thing. So um, with that, I will try to answer any questions if you have questions on this.